there's an interesting point here, which is that we're looking at science, and you're not really saying something new about science itself. Yeah. Like the story about the computers is pretty straightforward. It's really a question of interpreting the science. So what does it mean? It's almost a. It's not really, but it's not really a classic philosophical question either, because it's the kind of question that scientists ask themselves. Yeah. So I, I think that if we start asking ourselves, what is life? What's the essence of that makes something living very different from something like this desk or this gloss, which is clearly not living, then I think it is helpful to understand what we're made of, what the DNA is made of, what the proteins are made of, how they interact with each other. But it's almost, it's certainly the case that what makes life so wonderful and so different is some kind of emergent properties yeah. that are having some kind of downward causation on the atoms and the molecules and the proteins and the, and the DNA in my body. And so what we sometimes think of in fields like systems biology is try to look at biology at this more systems level and ask ourselves, are there new emergent principles that arise yeah. um, that have real causal efficacy that allow us to understand in a better way what's going on? And you know, inevitably, this must be true, even if just for the simple reason that evolution has to search through the space of possibilities, and it has a limited amount of time to do so. Yes. And so it's been remarkably successful. Look around us. Right? So therefore, there is something about that possibility space that must be restricted. And so I think part of the way of we're going to have to understand that possibility space in terms of some kind of emergent properties. There's some kind of emergent possibility space within which evolution is searching. Well, we, we may be disagreeing here. There's, okay. a, there's a possibility space for evolution. Well, for, there's a biological possibility space, okay. which I talked about mathematics, which is a logical possibility okay. space, but there's a biological possibility space, which is just as eternal and unchanging. Um, s certain kinds of biological interactions are possible, and you know much more about them than I do, but they were possible before there was any molecules that existed. They, they're possible now. And so there's a biological possibility space which determines um, what is possible in... in, in um, in genetics and in proteins and in uh, me metabolism. And this is what Andreas Wagner has written about in his new book, Arrival of the Fittest, which I find an absolutely wonderful book talking about what is possible in biology, that there are these spaces. And what biology does is it explores this possibility spaces. And there's a lot of possibilities which are realized, and there's a great many which aren't realized. But what is realized and what isn't realized makes no difference to the possibility space. The possibility space is eternal and unchanging. And you've also written more about these possibility spaces. And you've said that sometimes it may be better to talk about possibility spaces rather than just physical laws. Yes. Do you want to explain that a little bit? Um, Maybe you use something, an example in physics rather than biology well, to explain well, what you mean. Well, okay, an example in physics is that um, the Earth, the Moon creates tides on the Earth, okay? Now, why does it create tides on the Earth? Because of the force of gravity, and the gravity pulls the ocean more on this side than that side. So what is gravity? It's, it's, it's an attraction which is inversely proportional. So now we understand gravity. No, we don't. We've just given it a name. <laughs> just because you've given the thing a name doesn't mean you've understood it. Um, and so well, what is useful? And, and there's, there's this debate in the philosophy of physics. Do, do the laws of physics cause things to happen or do they describe what happens? Do, do, they, do they control matter or do they provide a description of what matter does? And I, don't th I think it's very difficult to get any answer to that. But what we can do is, without getting into that, is we can talk about the possibility. So if I'm playing tennis or football, I cannot violate energy conservation, momentum conservation, anything like, like that. And so I've got a set of possibilities which are strictly regulated, and that's described by a phase space in term, physics terms. And so the phase space sets out what is possible and what isn't possible, and our actions choose from that some of the possibilities, and they don't realize some of the other possibilities. So, and this gets around this difficulty of whether the laws are describing the world or causing things, yeah. yes. because the possibility space doesn't 
take a stand on, on those two Correct. philosophical points yeah. of view. And, and it's the same with the biological realm. Yeah. So this is the advantage. And so, of course, the difficulty with these biological possibility spaces is that, you know, we make some estimates of what they might be like based on the kind of life that we see. Mm. But it's really hard to know whether that, how big that possibility space might be, right? So huge. it can be huge, huge. yes, absolutely huge. So, you know, and if you look over biological history, you know, life has changed a lot over time. Yeah. Um, there used to be not, basically almost no oxygen in the atmosphere yeah. until cyanobacteria started creating oxygen. So that completely changed the possibility spaces, if you wish. Uh, and so you can imagine that, you know, if at some point, you know, uh, 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 the, the, the atmosphere changes yep. and oxygen gets used up. Yeah, but, but, but we, maybe we, something completely different will take over. Yeah, right? yeah, but but there's the abstract, eternal, unchanging possibility space, which is the one which um, Wagner talks about. Then there is um, the, the possibility landscape, which evolutionary people talk about. Now that changes with time, yeah. because as you say, what, what's possible is different if you have an oxygen atmosphere or, an, or, or or a methane atmosphere or something like that. And so Waddington's landscape changes, and in fact, animals can change that, because in fact they did. Bacteria changed that landscape, but they didn't change the one up here. They didn't change the nature of chemical reactions. That was unchanged while Waddington's landscape changed from, from favoring cyanogen-based to, to, to oxygen-based. Maybe my worry about the biological possibility spaces remains that they are so big and vast yeah. that it's going to be hard for us to get any kind of handle on them, as opposed to maybe the you know the possibility space that I would use to look at gravity is you know somewhat simpler. Oh, very simple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so, yeah. Um, well, it's so, the, so the it's, question it's, is, how fruitful would this concept be? Uh, well, I think what is very important there is there's this puzzle in evolutionary biology, which is how has there been time since the beginning of the universe? to explore the possibilities, because yeah. this number of possibilities is so big. And the problem is, uh, if, 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 if every millionth of a second genes were to explore the possibilities of proteins, there isn't time since the beginning of the universe to explore and arrive at the molecules we see here. If you use a simple interpretation, and Fred Hoyle was very, very aware of that. He, the physicists find this very, very puzzling. And I think this is what Andreas Wagner's book um, yeah. helps us to sort out. Yeah. So just to be clear, we both believe evolution happens, right? Oh, yeah. And everything that happens, it's more of a question of exactly what made it possible and what made it so fruitful. Yeah. And I think you know, clearly it's variation and natural selection which happened. Yeah. But the question, I think part of the issue is that in a lot of evolutionary thinking, the emphasis has been on the natural selection, yeah. and they've ignored this question of the variation that arises. So the variation arises, then it gets selected. Yeah. But the right kind of variation has to arise. Yes. And so what's really interesting is to think, well, what kind of variation can arise? And could that variation be, you know, is it anything goes, or is actually the variation itself structured in certain directions rather than other directions? And, yeah. and it seems like, and this is what Andreas Wagner's work and other people in that area seem to show that there are properties of the molecules of life, for example, and the, meta the me metabolic, metabolic networks of life that make it particularly easy to find certain types of viable variation yeah. that then can get selected. So and that, that helps explain, that is probably an explanation for this old question of, that Hoyle worried about, which is yeah. how on earth did we get this stuff to work. So in other words, you get convergent evolution, not only at the level of animals and eyes and limbs, but at the level of molecules. Yeah, it seems to be the case. Yeah. Yeah? So this may explain. So convergent evolution, the idea that you get the same evolutionary solution more than once, is remarkable as soon as you start thinking about the size of the possibility spaces, yeah. because they seem so hyper-astronomically large, but and yet you see Convergence. But, but from, from the physics viewpoint, the question which is I'm starting to try to wonder about and made very little progress is that that biological possibility space is based in the underlying physics. Yeah. And so what limits are there on the physics in order that this biological possibility space could emerge? And that's where this issue of fine tuning comes in. Yeah. If I were to take the physics and alter it a little bit in some alternative universe, would 
Wagner's possibility space still be there? Would there be a different possibility space? Would all biology be impossible or would you get much bigger range of biological possibilities? And so that's this issue of the relation from the underlying physics to this biological possibility space. And I think it's an absolutely fascinating area.